Chapter One of Up from Slavery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Yu. Up from Slavery by Booker T. Washington. Chapter One. A Slave Among Slaves. I was born a slave on. A plantation in Franklin County, Virginia. I am not quite sure of the exact place or exact date of my birth, but at any rate, I suspect I must have been born somewhere and at some time. As nearly as I have been able to learn, I was born near a crossroads post office called Hales Ford, and the year was 1858 or 1859. I do not know the month or the day. The earliest impression I can now recall are of the plantation and the slave quarters. The latter being the part of the plantation where the slaves had their cabins. My life had its beginning in the midst of the most miserable, desolate, and discouraging surroundings. They were so, however, not because my owners were especially cruel, for they were not. As compared with many others, I was born in a typical log cabin about fourteen by sixteen feet square. In this cabin, I lived with my mother and a brother and sister till after the Civil War, when we were all declared free. Of my ancestry, I know almost nothing. In the slave quarters, and even later, I heard whispered conversations among the colored people of the tortures which the slaves, including no doubt my ancestors on my mother's side, suffered in the middle passage of the slave ships, which being conveyed from Africa to America. I have been unsuccessful in securing any information that would throw any accurate light upon the history of my family beyond my mother. She, I remember, had a half brother and a half sister. In the days of slavery, not very much attention was given to family history and family records, that is, black family records. My mother, I suppose, attracted the attention of a purchaser who was afterward my owner and hers. Her addition to the slave family soon attracted about as much attention as the purchase of a new horse or cow. Of my father, I know even less than of my mother. I do not even know his name. I have heard reports to the effect that he was a white man. Who lived on one of the nearby plantations, wherever he was, I never heard of his taking the least interest in me or providing in any way for my rearing. But I do not find a special fault with him. He was simply another unfortunate victim of the institution which the nation unhappily had engrafted upon it at that time. The cabin was not only our living place, but was also used as the kitchen for the plantation. My mother was the plantation cook. The cabin was without glass windows; it had only opening in the side which let in the light and also the cold, chilly air of winter. There was a door to the cabin. That is something that was called a door, but the uncertain hinges by which. It was hung, and the large cracks in it, to say nothing of the fact that it was too small, made the room a very uncomfortable one. In addition to this opening, there was in the lower right-hand corner of the room the cat hole, a contrivance which almost every mansion or cabin in Virginia possessed during the antebellum period. The cat hole was a square opening about seven by eight inches, provided for the purpose of letting the cat pass in and out of the house at will during the night. In the case of our particular cabin, I could never understand the necessity for this convenience, since there were at least a half dozen other places in the cabin that would have accommodated the cats. There was no wooden floor in our cabin, the naked earth being used as a floor. 
In the center of the earthen floor there was a large, deep opening covered with boards, which was used as a place in which to store sweet potatoes during the winter. An impression of this potato hole is very distinctly engraved upon my memory because I recall that during the process of putting the potatoes in or taking them out, I would often come into possession of one or two, which I roasted and thoroughly enjoyed. There was no cooking stove on our plantation, and all the cooking for the whites and slaves my mother had to do over an open fireplace mostly in pots and skillets, while the poorly built cabin caused us to suffer with cold in winter. The heat from the open fireplace in summer was equally trying. The early years of my life, which were spent in the little cabin, were not very different from those of thousands of other slaves. My mother, of course, had little time in which to give attention to the training of her children during the day. She snatched a few moments for our care in the early morning before her work began, and at night after the day's work was done. One of my earliest recollections is that of my mother cooking a chicken late at night and awakening her children for the purpose of feeding them. How or where she got it, I do not know. I presume, however, it was procured from our owner's farm. Some people may call this theft. If such a thing were to happen now, I should condemn it as theft myself. But taking place at the time it did, and for the reason that it did, no one could ever make the belief that my mother was guilty of thieving. She was simply a victim of the system of slavery. I cannot remember having slept in a bed until after our family was declared free by the Emancipation Proclamation. Three children, John, my old brother, Amanda, my sister, and myself, had a pallet on the dirt floor. Or, to be more correct, we slept in and on a bundle of filthy rags laid upon the dirt floor. I was asked not long ago to tell something about the sports and pastimes that I engaged in during my youth. Until that question was asked, it had never occurred to me that there was no period of my life that was devoted to play. From the time that I can remember anything, almost every day of my life had been occupied in some kind of labor, though I think I would now be a more useful man if I had had time for sports. During the period that I spent in slavery, I was not large enough to be of much service. Still, I was occupied most of the time in cleaning the yards, carrying water to the men in the fields, or going to the mill to which I used to take the corn once a week to be ground. The mill was about three miles from the plantation. This work I always dreaded. The heavy bag of corn would be thrown across the back of the horse, and the corn divided about evenly on each side. But in some way, almost without exception on these trips, the corn would so shift as to become unbalanced and would fall off the horse, and often I would fall with it. As I was not strong enough to reload the corn upon the horse, I would have to wait sometimes for many hours till a chance passerby came along who would help me out of my trouble. The hours while waiting for someone were usually spent in crying. The time consumed in this way made me late in reaching the mill, and by the time I got my corn ground and reached home, it would be far into the night. The road was a lonely one and often led through dense forests. I was always frightened. The woods were said to be full of soldiers who had deserted from the army, and I had been told that the first thing a deserter did to a Negro boy when he found him alone was to cut off his ears. Besides, when I was late in getting home, I knew I would always get a severe scolding or a flogging. I had no schooling, whatever, while I was a slave. 
though I remember on several occasions I went as far as the schoolhouse door with one of my young mistresses to carry her books. The picture of several dozen boys and girls in a schoolroom engaged in study made a deep impression upon me, and I had the feeling that to get into a schoolhouse and study in this way would be about the same as getting into paradise. So far as I can now recall, the first knowledge that I got or the fact that we were slaves and that freedom of the slaves was being discussed was early one morning before day when I was awakened by my mother kneeling over her children and fervently praying that Lincoln and his armies might be successful and that one day she and her children might be free. In this connection, I have never been able to understand how the slaves throughout the South, completely ignorant as were the masses so far as books or newspapers were concerned, were able to keep themselves so accurately and completely informed about the great national question that were agitating the country. From a time that Garrison, Lovejoy, and others began to agitate for freedom, the slaves throughout the South kept in close touch with the progress of the movement. Though I was a mere child during the preparation for the Civil War and during the war itself, I now recall the many late at night whispered discussions that I heard my mother and the other slaves on the plantation indulge in. These discussions show that they understood the situation and that they kept themselves informed of events by what was termed the grapevine telegraph. During the campaign, when Lincoln was first a candidate for the presidency, the slaves on our far-off plantation, miles from any railroad or large city or daily newspapers, knew what the issues involved were. When war was begun, between the North and the South, every slave on our plantation felt and knew that though other issues were discussed, the primal one was that of slavery. Even the most ignorant members of my race on the remote plantations felt in their hearts with a certainty that admitted of no doubt that the freedom of the slaves would be the one great result of the war if the Northern armies conquered. Every success of the Federal armies and every defeat of the Confederate forces was watched with the keenest and most intense interest. Often the slaves got knowledge of the results of the great battles before the white people received it. This news was usually gotten from the colored man who was sent to the post office for the mail. In our case, the post office was about three miles from the plantation, and the mail came once or twice a week. The man who was sent to the office would linger about the place long enough to get the drift of the conversation from the group of white people who naturally congregated there, after receiving their mail to discuss the latest news. The mail carrier on his way back to our master's house would as naturally retail the news that he had secured among the slaves, and in this way they often heard of important events before the white people at the big house, as the master's house was called. I cannot remember a single instance during my childhood or early boyhood when our entire family sat down to the table together and God's blessing was asked and the family ate a meal in a civilized manner. On the plantation in Virginia and even later, meals were gotten by the children very much as dumb animals get theirs. It was a piece of bread here and a scrap of meat there. It was a cup of milk at one time and some potatoes at another. Sometimes a portion of our family would eat out of the skillet or pot while someone else would eat from a tin plate held on the knees and often using nothing but the hands with which to hold the food. 
When I had grown to sufficient size, I was required to go to the big house at meal times to fan the flies from the table by means of a large set of paper fans operated by a pulley. Naturally, much of the conversation of the white people turned upon the subject of freedom and the war, and I absorbed a good deal of it. I remember that at one time I saw two of my young mistresses and some lady visitors eating ginger cake in the yard. At that time, those cakes seemed to me to be absolutely the most tempting and desirable things that I had ever seen. And I then and there resolved that if I ever got free, the height of my ambition would be reached if I could get to the point where I could secure and eat ginger cakes in a way that I saw those ladies doing. Of course, as the war was prolonged, the white people, in many cases, often found it difficult to secure food for themselves. I think the slaves felt the deprivation less than the whites, because the usual diet for slaves was cornbread and pork, and these could be raised on the plantation. But coffee, tea, sugar, and other articles which the whites had been accustomed to use could not be raised on the plantation, and the conditions brought about by the war frequently made impossible to secure these things. The whites were often in great straits. Parched corn was used for coffee, and a kind of black molasses was used instead of sugar. Many times nothing was used to sweeten the so-called tea and coffee. The first pair of shoes that I recalled wearing were wooden ones. They had rough leather on the top, but the bottoms, which were about an inch thick, were of wood. When I walked, they made a fearful noise, and besides this, they were very inconvenient, since there was no yielding to the natural pressure of the foot. In wearing them, one presented an exceedingly awkward appearance. The most trying ordeal that I was forced to endure as a slave boy, however, was the wearing of a flax shirt. In the portion of Virginia where I lived, it was common to use flax as part of the clothing for the slaves. That part of the flax from which our clothing was made was largely from the refuse, which, of course, was the cheapest and roughest part. I can scarcely imagine any torture except perhaps the pulling of a tooth that is equal to that caused by putting on a new flax shirt for the first time. It is almost equal to the feeling that one would experience if he had a dozen or more chestnut burns, or a hundred small pinpoints in contact with his flesh. Even to this day I can recall accurately the tortures that I underwent when putting on one of these garments. The fact that my flesh was soft and tender added to the pain, but I had no choice. I had to wear the flax shirt or none, and had it been left to me to choose, I should have chosen to wear no covering. In connection with the flax shirt, my brother John, who is several years older than I am, performed one of the most generous acts that I ever heard of one slave relative doing for another. On several occasions, when I was being forced to wear a new flax shirt, he generously agreed to put it on in my stead and wear it for several days till it was broken in. Until I had grown to be quite a youth, this single garment was all that I wore. One may get the idea from what I have said that there was bitter feeling toward the white people on the part of my race, because of the fact that most of the white population was away fighting in a war which would result in keeping the Negro in slavery if the South was successful. In the case of the slaves on our place, this was not true, and it was not true of any large portion of the slave population in the South where the Negro was treated with anything like decency. During the Civil War, one of my young masters was killed and two were severely wounded. I recall the feeling of sorrow which existed among the slaves when 
they heard of the death of Mars Billy. It was no sham sorrow, but real. Some of the slaves had nursed Mars Billy, others had played with him when he was a child. Mars Billy had begged for mercy in the case of others when the overseer or master was thrashing them. The sorrow in the slave quarters was only second to that in the big house when the two young masters were brought home wounded. The sympathy of the slaves was shown in many ways. They were just as anxious to assist in the nursing as the family relatives of the wounded. Some of the slaves would even beg for the privilege of sitting up at night to nurse their wounded masters. This tenderness and sympathy on the part of those held in bondage was a result of their kindly and generous nature. In order to defend and protect the women and children who were left on the plantation when the white males went to war, the slave who was selected to sleep in the big house during the absence of the males was considered to have the place of honor. Anyone attempting to harm young mistress or old mistress during the night would have had to cross the dead body of the slave to do so. I do not know how many have noticed it, but I think that it will be found to be true that there are few instances, either in slavery or freedom, in which a member of my race has been known to betray a specific trust. As a rule, not only did the members of my race entertain no feeling of bitterness against the whites before and during the war, but there are many instances of Negroes tenderly caring for their former masters and mistresses who for some reason have become poor and dependent since the war. I know of instances where the former masters of slaves have for years been supplied with money by their former slaves to keep them from suffering. I have known of still other cases in which the former slaves have assisted in the education of the descendants of their former owners. I know of a case on a large plantation in the south in which a young white man, the son of the former owner of the estate, has become so reduced in purse and self-control by reason of drink that he is a pitiable creature. And yet, notwithstanding the poverty of the colored people themselves on this plantation, they have for years supplied this young white man with the necessities of life. One sends him a little coffee or sugar, another, another a little meat, and so on. Nothing that the colored people possess is too good for the son of old Mass Tom who will perhaps never be permitted to suffer while any remain on the place who knew directly or indirectly of old Mass Tom. I have said that there are few instances of members of my race betraying our specific trust. One of the best illustrations of this which I know of is in the case of an ex-slave from Virginia whom I met not long ago in a little town in the state of Ohio. I found that this man had made a contact with his master who two or three years previous to the Emancipation Proclamation to the fact that the slave was to be permitted to buy himself by paying so much per year for his body and while he was paying for himself he was to be permitted to labor where and for whom he pleased. Finding that he could secure better wages in Ohio, he went there. When freedom came, he was still in debt to his master some $300. Notwithstanding that the Emancipation Proclamation freed him from any obligation to his master, this black man walked the greater portion of the distance back to where his old master lived in Virginia and placed the last dollar with interest in his hands. In talking to me about this, the man told me that he knew that he did not have to pay the debt, but that he had given his word to the master, and his word he had never broken. 
he felt that he could not enjoy his freedom till he had fulfilled his promise. From some things that I have said, one may get the idea that some of the slaves did not want freedom. This is not true. I have never seen one who did not want to be free, or one who would return to slavery. I pity from the bottom of my heart any nation or body of people that is so unfortunate as to get entangled in the net of slavery. I have long since ceased to cherish any spirit of bitterness against the southern white people on account of the enslavement of my race. No one section of that country was wholly responsible for its introduction, and besides, it was recognized and protected for years by the general government. Having once got its tentacles fastened on to the economic and social life of the Republic, it was no easy matter for the country to relieve itself of the institution. Then, when we rid ourselves of prejudice or racial feeling and look facts in the face, we must acknowledge that notwithstanding the cruelty and moral wrong of slavery, the ten million Negroes inhabiting this country, who themselves or whose ancestors went through the school of American slavery, are in a stronger and more hopeful condition, materially, intellectually, morally, and religiously, than is, the, than is true of an equal number of black people in any other portion of the globe. This is so to such an extent that Negroes in this country, who themselves or whose forefathers went through the school of slavery, are constantly returning to Africa as missionaries to enlighten those who remained in the fatherland. This I say not to justify slavery, on the other hand, I condemn it as an institution, as we all know that in America it was established for selfish and financial reasons, and not from a missionary motive but call attention to a fact and to show how providence so often uses men and institutions to accomplish a purpose. When persons ask me in these days how, in the midst of what sometimes seemed hopelessly discouraging conditions, I can have such faith in the future of my race and this country, I remind them of the wilderness through which and out of which a good providence had already led us. Ever since I have been old enough to think for myself, I have entertained the idea that notwithstanding the cruel wrongs inflicted upon us, the black man got nearly as much out of slavery as the white man did. The hurtful inferences of the institution were not by any means confined to the Negro. This was fully illustrated by the life upon our own plantation. The whole machinery of slavery was so constructed as to cause labor, as a rule, to be looked upon as a batch of degradation of inferiority. Hence, labor was something that both races on the slave plantations sought to escape. The slave system on our place, in a large measure, took the spirit of self-reliance and self-help out of the white people. My old master had many boys and girls, but not one, so far as I know, ever mastered a single trade or special line of productive industries. The girls were not taught to cook, sew, or to take care of the house. All of this was left to the slaves. The slaves, of course, had little personal interest in the life of the plantation, and their ignorance prevented them from learning how to do things in the most improved and thorough manner. As a result of the system, fences were out of repair, gates were hanging half off the hinges, doors creaked, window panes were out, plastering had fallen but was not replaced, weeds grew in the yard. As a rule there was food for whites and blacks, but inside the house and on the dining room table 
there was wanting that delicacy and refinement of both of touch and finish which can make a home the most convenient comfortable and attractive place in the world withal there was a waste of food and outer materials which was sad when freedom came the slaves were almost as well fitted to begin life anew as the master except in the matter of book learning and ownership of property the slave owner and his sons had mastered no special industry they unconsciously had imbibed the feeling that manual labor was not the proper thing for them on the other hand the slaves in many cases had mastered some handicraft and none were ashamed and few unwilling to labor finally the war closed and the day of freedom came it was a momentous and eventful day to all upon our plantation we had been expecting it freedom was in the air and had been for months deserting soldiers returning to their homes were to be seen every day others who had been discharged or whose regiments had been paroled were constantly passing near our place the grapevine telegraph was kept busy night and day the news and mutterings of great events were swiftly carried from one plantation to another in the fear of yankee invasions the silverware and other valuables were taken from the big house buried in the woods and guarded by trusted slaves woe be to any one who would have attempted to disturb the buried treasure the slaves would give the yankee soldiers food drink clothing anything but that which had been specifically entrusted to their care and honor as the great day drew nearer there was more singing in the slave quarters than usual it was bolder had more ring and lasted later into the night most of the verses of the plantation songs had some reference to freedom true they had sung those same verses before but they had been careful to explain that the freedom in these songs referred to the next world and had no connection with life in this world now they gradually threw off the mask and were not afraid to let it be known that the freedom in their songs mean freedom of the body in this world the night before the eventful day word was sent to the slave quarters to the effect that something unusual was going to take place at the big house the next morning there was there was little if any sleep that night all as excitement and expectancy early the next morning word was sent to all the slaves old and young to gather at the house in company with my mother brother and my sister and a large number of other slaves i went to the master's house all of our master's family were either standing or seated on the veranda of the house where they could see what was to take place and hear what was said there was a feeling of deep interest or, or perhaps sadness on the faces but not bitterness as i now recall the impression they made upon me they did not at the moment seem to be sad because of the loss of property but rather because of parting with those whom they had reared and who were in many ways very close to them the most distinct thing that i now recall in connection with the scene was that some man who seemed to be a stranger in brackets a united states officer i presume made a little speech and then read a rather long paper the emancipation proclamation i think after the reading we were told that we were all free and could go when and where we pleased my mother who was standing by my side leaned over and kissed her children while tears of joy ran down her cheeks she explained to us what it all meant that this was the day for which she had been so long playing but fearing that she would never live to see for some minutes there was great rejoicing and thanksgiving and wild scenes of ecstasy but 
there was no feeling of bitterness. In fact, there was pity among the slaves for our former owners. The wild rejoicing on the part of the emancipated colored people lasted but for a brief period. For I noticed that by the time they returned to their cabins, there was a change in their feelings. The great responsibility of being free, or having charge of themselves, or having to think and plan for themselves and their children, seemed to take possession of them. It was very much like suddenly turning a youth of ten or twelve years out into the world to provide for himself. In a few hours, the great question with which the Anglo-Saxon race had been grappling for centuries had been thrown upon these people to be solved. These were the questions of a home, a living, the rearing of children, education, citizenship, and the establishment and support of churches. Was it any wonder that within a few hours the wild rejoicing ceased and a feeling of deep gloom seemed to pervade the slave quarters? To some, it seemed that now that they were in actual possession of it, freedom was a more serious thing than they had expected to find it. Some of the slaves were seventy or eighty years old. Their best days were gone. They had no strength with which to earn a living in a strange place and among strange people, even if they have been sure where to find a new place of abode. To this class, the problem seemed especially hard. Besides, deep down in their hearts, there was a strange and peculiar attachment to old masters and to old misses and to their children which they found it hard to think of breaking off. Of these, they had spent in some cases nearly half a century, and it was no light thing to think of parting. Gradually, one by one, stealthily at first, the older slaves began to wander from the slave quarters back to the big house to have a whispered conversation with their former owners as to the future. End of chapter 1 Recording by Andy Yu, Mississauga, Canada.